everyone. Welcome to tonight's program with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Clara Jeffrey, Editor-in-Chief of Mother Jones, and tonight we're thrilled to be in conversation with Jason Kanner discussing his fascinating career in public service and politics. Jason is an Afghanistan war veteran, the founder of Let America Vote, former Missouri Secretary of State, host of the Majority 54 podcast, and he's running for mayor of Kansas City. His new yeah, book... Yeah, Kansas City. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much. He's going to tell us about barbecue later. Um, his new book, Outside the Wire, just debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. Help me in giving Jason a warm welcome to Inforum. Okay, Jason, let's cut to the chase. Um, many political observers considered you a young man in a hurry. You were the first millennial to hold statewide office. You host a podcast. You were an author of a well-timed political memoir. You visited most states, notably Iowa and New Hampshire. And <laughs> folks, I think, expected you to perhaps put your hat in the ring for president as soon as 2020. Um, but, and so you surprised people when you decided to run for mayor instead. Can you tell me why you made that decision? Have you ever been to Kansas City? I have not. Come to Kansas City, you'll understand. <laughs> uh, who's been to Kansas City? Okay, all of these people understand. Uh, now, okay, so, um, you know, one of the things I write about in the book is that we're living through grabbing ore territory, and that you gotta do everything you can for your friends and for your neighbors right now. And my, my town, uh, Kansas City, has experienced a ton of progress uh, in the last several years under the leadership of, of Sly James, um, who is a great friend of mine and, and an outstanding mayor. And now the question is, is the progress going to continue, and is everybody in Kansas City going to be able to see it and feel it? Um, and I'm really passionate about, about that. I mean, I'm a fifth-generation Kansas Cityan. My wife and I are raising a sixth-generation Kansas Cityan. Um, and I just want to do absolutely everything I can for my friends and neighbors. I mean, I, we live on a safe street. We're doing well. And two miles from us, uh, it's not that way. And I feel that I can make a difference there, so that's what I'm doing. So um, here in San Francisco, I, I think it's safe to say our biggest problems are housing and homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, what are the biggest challenges that Kansas City faces right now? Well, crime is, is, um, is certainly one of them. Um, and that has to do with poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, it's no different than anywhere else. It has to do with poverty. It has to do with education. Um, you know, I think one, for me, like I think of this at a, at a little bit of a larger level. I think about it as making sure that no matter where you live in town and no matter how you grew up, that you can find success without having to leave town or without having to move across town. Like when I think about my vision for Kansas City, that's really what it is. And when I'm in a place like San Francisco, I try and expand on that a little bit because probably there's, I hope that there will be, but there's probably not a lot of you in the room who have said, well, you know, once your kid um, goes to somewhere in the Midwest, you know, you never get them back. Um, but, <laughs> but you hear that a lot about the West Coast from the Midwest. And, and that's, I want to change that. And, uh, and I want to change that for Kansas City. So for me, whether it is um, our very high homicide rate right now, whether it is uh, our schools needing to improve, you know, continuing to have job opportunities, all of those amount to, for me, just thinking about it as what we're all really trying to do, and we may not always think about it this way in politics, but what we're all really trying to do is create communities where our kids don't feel like they have to leave in order to find opportunity. They may choose to, but we want, them, we want that to be a choice. I mean, my son, he turns five in, in two and a half weeks, and he has no idea that like, if he goes away to college, I'm going to be his roommate. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, that's all... It's all any of us want. We just want to be around our family. And, and so to me, that's the challenge. We've, we're doing great things in Kansas City, but I want to continue it and make sure that it touches everybody. And, you know, you've been in the state legislature and ha held statewide office. What are the, the powers or the limitations of power that a mayor has that you're anticipating? Yeah, um, there are limitations, but then there are also advantages compared to those jobs that I had in the past, right? Um, when I was the secretary of state, uh, there was a lot that I could do administratively, and I did. Uh, I made Missouri, made Missouri the, I can't remember if it's 16th or 17th state in the country to put the voter registration form online. But in order to do that, I had to pretty much go around the legislature, had to find a provision in the law that would allow me to do that because it was a GOP supermajority and they were not cool with it. So, so, you know, 
at the same time, I had a GOP supermajority. So like I couldn't get, even though I had a Republican co-sponsor for early voting who was the vice chair of the elections committee, not co-sponsor, sponsor, I was secretary of state, I, I couldn't get a hearing in, in his own committee because they didn't want people to have more voting opportunities. So there were natural limitations there. As mayor, obviously, uh, it's not the same way, right? If you have a good relationship with your council, um, you can get a lot done. But then again, um, we have a, uh, a state government that's not always amenable to the things that we want to do. That's a, that's a <laughs> diplomatic way to put it. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, the governor right now, um, we had a governor who you all read about. We don't have him anymore. <laughs> um, the lieutenant governor became governor. He and I disagree on all sorts of things. Uh, lots and lots of things. He's wrong about a lot of stuff. But, <laughs> but, but we served in the House together. Um, and when I was Secretary of State uh, and I was running for the U.S. Senate, and I'm sure everybody was telling him not to do this, he sponsored a major piece of legislation for me, and we got it passed. So it's, it's about relationships, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to lever leveraging those for my town. If you become mayor, will you still run Let America Vote? Uh, I will transfer the leadership of Let America Vote uh, over to somebody else. Mayor's a full-time job. And what about the podcast? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> you know, we just, um, the final episode of season two goes up on Friday, um, and I I just don't know what I'm going to have time for going forward. I, mean, I, I don't know. But mayor's a full-time job, and, and I'm absolutely going to treat it that way. You first came to national attention when you ran against Roy Blout for U.S. Senate and ran an ad in which you assembled an assault rifle blindfolded. I think everyone probably remembers that. Um, what was the point that you were trying to make? The point I was trying to make was, I am right about gun control, <laughs> and the NRA is wrong, and I know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm curious, though, do you think that that's what it takes for Heartland candidates who are for gun control to fend off the NRA, like combat experience and the ability to assemble an assault rifle blindfold? No. Uh, one of the things, um, they've trained me to say things like, in the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that, uh, that I write about in Outside the Wire is the concept of, that's the other way you can do it, is use the, the is, is the concept, uh, I refer to it as show your math. and indulge me for a second. Um, so you know when you were in school, and uh, at least this is my experience, uh, you like got to the bottom of the equation, you wrote down your answer, and then you get the test back, and the teacher would circle your answer um, because they disagreed with your answer. Um, they called it the wrong answer, I just, they disagreed with it. Um, <laughs> I figured out, that happened to me a lot, and uh, I figured out at some point that if I showed my math, if I took them on my little misadventure, that they would sometimes put a half point next to my <laughs> little journey. And I think that's true in politics too. So what I'm getting at is, people are okay with you uh, believing something they don't believe, as long as they know two things. One, not, this is not always true, but I think it's often true, and it explains some of my success in Missouri. Uh, as long as they know two things. One, you really believe what you're saying, and two, you believe it because you care about them. And that ad is really just me showing my math. It's me saying, look, this is what I believe. You may not agree with me, but let me tell you how I got there. Let me show you my math. And not long ago, uh, I was doing a q and A. I don't remember where I was actually, but I was doing a Q&A and, um, and a, a woman asked me a similar question about how do we get across to folks. And I asked her, I kind of guided her through showing her math. And she said, how do I convince people about this? And I said, well, let me ask you, what is, what is it in your life uh, that makes it where you care so deeply. She had a Moms Demand shirt on. I said, what made you uh, go and, and, and join Moms Demand? And, and she said, I'm tired of every time I'm in a restaurant with my kids, I sit down and I'm looking to see where all the exits are in case somebody starts shooting and I gotta get my kids out of there. And I said, that's what you should say to people. And, and if that woman were to run for office and have to talk about that issue, I would tell her, that's what you should say in your ad. Um, because in my case, yeah, I'm sure there is an element, there's a cultural element of I understand what I'm talking about, but really it's just showing your math. Show people how you got there. Because a lot of times, like with me, a lot of people were like, I don't agree with him, but they're like, I see how he, I see how he got there. Yeah. And they'll, they'll vote for you still. You, you um, enlisted right after 9-11, and it's clear from your book, Outside the Wire, <laughs> that you had a lot Thank of, you for doing this, Claire. <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> that you had a lot of valuable experience in Afghanistan. But I wonder, with the benefit of almost 20 years of hindsight, if it's still a cause you would have signed up for. Yes. Um, you want me to elaborate? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I, in, in fact, I've had a lot of young people, I, I, I've spoken it on college campuses a fair amount, and, uh, and I've had a lot of young people come up and ask me, given who the commander in chief is, um, should, they, should they join? And I just tell them what my thought process was at the time. And I, and I, I t like I, so I decided to join right after 9-11, but I, uh, I had to have knee surgery and go through physical therapy, so I couldn't, I didn't actually get to enlist till 03. So in that, in that time, it was the run up to the Iraq war. And I ended up serving in Afghanistan, but I could have just as easily served in Iraq, and I had a lot of friends who did. And so, and I was against the war, the Iraq war, and I was struggling with that, but I never struggled with whether or not I should serve, because I just figured if I was good at my job, then that might mean two things. One, or if I did the job, it would mean one thing, which is somebody else wouldn't have to in my place. And two, if I was good at it, maybe I would result in somebody else getting home safe. And, and that was my whole thought process. And I don't think that that, I don't think that, that changes uh, now. And I also think um, that, well, I think, thank God, that we have so many people in the ranks. I know we do. I know so many of them who I know are are going to do the right thing. And I know they're going to keep the code, keep the faith of they're not going to obey any legal order. They're not going to obey any moral order. And so I think it's really important. I would do it again, yeah, for sure. Um, you were Missouri's Secretary of State accepting Kathleen Harris in the hanging Chad chaos of 2000. It was a job that sort of flew under the radar for, for most people. Can you explain what kind of power Secretaries of State have over elections? It's a perfect example to bring up Florida in 2000 because here's the power that, uh, that secretaries of state have had, and it connects to the last question, had you had a different secretary of state in Florida in 2000, there never would have been a war in Iraq, right. um, which, pff, right? Mm -hmm. um, secretaries of state and not just secretaries of state, county clerks in some states, it's county recorders or county auditors local election authorities have an enormous role to play uh, in, that, in the elections process. Um, right now, back home, across the state line, there's a fellow named Chris Kobach, um, who apparently has name recognition here. Uh, and, uh, you know, S Secretary Kobach um, just had to be convinced to recuse himself from overseeing his own recount. Um, you know, I had a plan, in, I mean, just to tell you the difference, right? Uh, in 2016, we had a very close race. It turned out not so close that there was a recount. Um, but we, I, had, I had had to oversee a recount at one point uh, earlier in my term. And we had a plan in place. If there was a recount while I was on the ballot, I was going to recuse myself. My general counsel was going to run everything. We had a plan. Chris Kobach, on the other hand, was like, no, of course I'm going to oversee it until there was just so much pressure he had to step up. I mean, so that, that's an example. Um, but yeah. A chief election official has three major responsibilities, in my opinion. Uh, one, make sure only eligible voters vote. Two, make sure every eligible voter has the opportunity to vote. And three, make sure every eligible voter meets convenience at the polls. I started Let America Vote because, um, unfortunately, the Republican Party nationally has decided to make number two and number three weirdly controversial. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, Chris Kobach, um, mm -hmm. How did he, you, you, you say in the book, Outside the Wire, that, <laughs> that um, he, he particularly politicized a previously fairly nonpartisan meeting of secretaries of yeah. state, um, and that that was perhaps not the first indicator of what he was up to, but, but a sign of things to come. I'm wondering if you could elaborate. It is a good story. Now, it's only in every third copy, so <laughs> just to be safe. You should. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, um, I got elected uh, Secretary of State in November 2012. Um, I think January, I believe it was, 2013, maybe February, but shortly after I'd taken office, um, I went to the National Association of Secretaries of State meeting in D.C., which is every bit the raging party, it sounds like. <laughs> and, and it is a traditionally largely nonpartisan, bipartisan, but largely nonpartisan organization where you exchange best practices on election administration, securities regulation, uh, business registration, all these things that, as you said, secretaries of state do that oftentimes you know about when they do them wrong exclusively. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that, that was its tradition. It was, you know, many of you for your professions have been to conferences uh, that you find very interesting and the average person might not find as interesting, right? But that's what it was. Um, now, Chris Kobach came in there with, he had sort of a little contingent of Tea Party uh, secretaries of state that had been elected 2010, 2012. And, uh, and everybody, uh, by the way, at, at the time, assumed I was a Republican. Anyway, I was the new guy, and I was from Missouri. So they just figured, well, this guy's probably a Republican. And I was just trying to make some friends, be nice to everybody. Um, and in that election, on election night, when President Obama won, he made sort of an impromptu remark, you may remember, in his, in his victory speech that night where he was talking about long lines at the polls, and he said, we ought to do something about that, by the way. Well, that became, because when a president speaks, it means a lot, or used to, and what... <laughs> And, and that became, um, unfortunately it still does, uh, that became um, a bunch of federal legislation. So that's the background. So Kobach shows up, Secretary Kobach shows up, and, uh, and he has uh, a letter that he wants everybody at NAS to sign on to, National Association of Secretaries of State, to sign on to that would say that the federal government should completely stay out of our elections, right? Now, he has this villainous superpower um, Kobach does, that, that everybody should know about. And that is that he can say racist, dangerous, extremist things in a kind Midwestern tone. Um, I'm not even joking right now. That, uh, that can deceive his audience, including an audience of secretaries of state. And it's a very scary thing because it's how he advances some of these ideas. And everybody is listening to him. And I've known the guy. I've shared a media market with him for a long time. I, I, you know, I know I know his deal. We live like 30 minutes apart, um, you know, across the state line. And so I'm going, this is totally partisan. And, and he's going, no, 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 it's not partisan, kind of trying to shame me. And, and, and at this point, I've been really nice and getting along with everybody. And then I said, well, look, it is partisan because uh, he was saying, I, you know, we should all just want the federal government to stay out of state elections. And I said, it is partisan because one party wants to keep the federal government out of our elections and the other party wants to let black people vote. And um, uh, his, his resolution was defeated and that's really the last meaningful conversation we had. It's interesting how states' rights yet again yeah. like rears its head, but only in particular uh, for particular ends. Um, you know, you not only ran against voter ID, um, and I think you said in the book that at the time seventy percent of Missourians yeah, um, thought it was 80, a good idea. Yeah. Um, but you effectively shamed the GOP legislature not to go there once you stepped down. So, what's your elevator? What's an elevator pitch that worked to shame the GOP? Uh, and in in that case. Um, well, in that case, it was a little unique because they had, they had made a deal, right? In, in Missouri, they had made a deal. They were going to pass photo ID pretty much in name only in exchange for the, uh, the Democrats in the, in the state Senate to, to sit down and not to filibuster. Um, and, and so they, they passed it, not totally in name only, but it, it, the Democrats were able to, to very much mitigate how much damage it would do. Um, and they had made this deal, like, this is all we're going to do. And then they got a Republican, they didn't expect to, but they got a Republican governor, um, and they got, you know, uh, they, they had big majorities, they had all, I mean, it's 2016, y'all were there. Um, <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden they were emboldened, and they were starting to say, well, let's just go whole hog, let's, let's do Wisconsin style, now we have this opportunity. And so w what I told them, um, I would love to tell you that what happened was I gave a speech and I changed the hearts and minds of a bunch of Republican legislators. That's not what happened. What happened is I... That would I, be amazing. That would be cool. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's not how you win on this issue right now. You win on this issue by having them understand they can lose elections over this issue. Um, and that's how you win on anything. Whether it, moms demand action, anything else right now. All, you know, all of these are us recognizing that when you introduce political consequences into the, into the equation, they're way more likely to do the right thing. And so let America vote. We just created big voter. But to back up to that situation, you know, I gave a speech when they didn't expect me to. I had a captive audience. And uh, I told them that American heroes had marched across a bridge in Selma for this stuff. And this argument's supposed to be over, but it's not. Um, and I basically, as the kids say, put them on blast. And I just said, I'm going to be watching. And I did what I did the whole time I was Secretary of State, which is I made my argument. For so long, people have been saying about the idea of winning the voting rights argument, not in court, but in the court of public opinion, people have been saying, well, we've been losing this argument for so long. And what I've been saying is, 
no, we haven't been participating in the argument. Mm -hmm. And so really what I did is I just let them know, just like when I was your secretary of state and I was able to mostly keep you from doing this stuff because I took you on on it and didn't shy away from it, I just said, I ain't going anywhere. I'm still going to be doing that. And, um, and I can't take for credit, like a lot of other people in Missouri have a lot to do with why it didn't advance. So um, if I hear you right, you're, you're also sort of saying that um, with the courts becoming more Trumpy, um, that the vote to uh, mitigate voter suppression is one, is a popular movement. Um, and I'm wondering, has that 70 to 80 percent in Missouri, do you know where that is now? Like, have, has this taken hold that you know of more broadly? I don't know. I haven't. It's a great question. I haven't seen a poll on where photo ID is right now in Missouri, but um, there's an important distinction to make here, which is at Let America Vote, we've done a lot of work to, to change minds nationally and to engage in this debate. But the other piece of it is we are not necessarily like we have like in the last month and a half or two months, we've knocked um, over 200,000 doors nationwide. But at most of those doors, we haven't been going door to door just talking about voting rights. Um, I'll give you an example of how we do this. Anybody here ever heard of Danica Rome? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, you go ahead if you want to applaud Danica Rome. I'm not going <laughs> to stop you. Um, so for those who do, for those who don't know, Danica Rome uh, is a trans woman who is, was elected in, in November of 2017 to the Virginia State House, to the House of Delegates. Um, she ran in Northern Virginia. Again, she's a Democrat. She ran against a Republican incumbent who was the sponsor of the transgender bathroom bill. Um, and she was a Let America Vote candidate. Uh, we, in total, uh, in Virginia, we knocked over 194,000 doors. I think we knocked over 30,000 in her district. And if I remember correctly, she won by something like 1,500 votes. Um, now, here's the important part of this. Her campaign was not about that bill. It was not about the transgender bathroom bill. And even though her opponent was very, very bad on voting rights, and that's why we targeted him, her campaign and what we said at the door was not about voting rights. She talked about traffic in Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. And that's what our people talked about at the door for Danica Rome, was traffic in Northern Virginia. It's bad. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it resonated. <laughs> and, and the point I'm making is, I, you know, most of the people who are knocking doors for us, they're, they're interns getting college credit. These are, these are amazing kids. We've got hundreds of them. I don't need them to go to every door and take somebody who voting rights, maybe they care about it, maybe they're not aware of it, and it's not a top 20 issue for them. I don't need when they step off that porch for it to be a top five issue. What I need is for the person who they just talked to to be ready to vote out the person who's been bad on voting rights. And that could be because of wages, healthcare, traffic, it doesn't matter. Our ultimate audience here is Republican elected officials who have adopted a political strategy, not a policy difference. This ain't taxes or healthcare or education. A political strategy of making it harder to vote for people who are less likely to vote for them. They do that to win elections. When they see that when they do that, college kids from Let America Vote and other interns and volunteers show up in their district and kick their butt, they're a lot less likely to continue doing it. And Danica Rome's a good example of that. She won her own race. I'm not, you know, um, but we were proud to help. So you guys, the folks that you endorse, um, I'm sure you like them for all sorts of reasons, but it's also yeah. that the people that they're running against are particularly bad on this issue. Yeah. Like Stacey Abrams is great, but also. Well, Stacey Abrams, um, I can't, it, it's hard for me to imagine somebody she would run against who I wouldn't want to endorse Stacey Abrams, but um, <laughs> I've, I've known Stacey for a really long time. We're really close. I went down and got the chance to actually introduce her for her announcement speech in Atlanta. Um, she's one of the three smartest humans I know. Um, and yes, to your point, she's running against Brian Kemp, uh, who is the Secretary of State of Georgia. And I mean, like, it is a perfect example. I mean, Stacey's been involved in registering folks to vote in Georgia for years. Brian Kemp has been involved in not accepting those registrations. And, and here's a guy, he's running for governor of Georgia, and in the meantime, he's purging hundreds of thousands of people off the voting rolls. Like, the math ain't real difficult there. I can do it even. You know, it's, we see what he's doing. And um, I think she's got a great chance to win. And yeah, it, it, it's going to make history, and that's very cool. She's going to be the first African-American woman governor uh, elected in history, first African-American governor in the Deep South. And that is very special. And you put all that aside, um, she's just going to be one of the best governors in the history of the country, and you should give her money. <laughs> She's just pretty amazing. 
You know, as Secretary of State, I feel like you have a, a particular uh, expertise, obviously, in, in how concerned we should be at reports that Russians have hacked state election sites and campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, were you, when you were Secretary of State, how much time did you spend on that kind of security? Was that yet known to be a threat? Uh, security was certainly, uh, at, at that point, it wasn't fully known, you know, the source of it. But we, I mean, we had a... We spent a lot of time on it. I mean, you know, there's a whole IT division um, where, you know, there's all sorts of screens. They had to really, like, really help me understand when I first became Secretary of State, everything going on with the servers and everything else. And um, clearly, I didn't understand it to the point where I can explain it to you, but I got it to where I could, <laughs> where I could do my job. Um, so it's a, it was a huge concern to begin with. Um, my level of concern, um, I, I, would, I would put it this way. Um, Elections in this country are very decentralized, uh, and in a way that is problematic because it, it can make some of the infrastructure outdated. But on the other hand, the fact that so much of the counting uh, and and the casting of ballots happens at the county and even lower level, that is in and of itself also a, a pretty important defense mechanism from, from interference in our elections. Um, I am concerned about it, like all of us are, because there seems to be no, I mean, the, the opposite of urgency uh, by Republicans in Washington. And I think what frustrates me about that more than anything, I think about it like, you know, my younger brother, before he became much bigger than me, when we were younger, like, we'd get in fights, and I'd, you know, he was my younger brother, I, I beat him up a little, you know, he handed it back later, don't worry. Um, but like if you came down the street from another house and you tried to beat up my little brother, like I was definitely going to beat you up. And that's like how it's supposed to work in this country. Like we, we're a family. Like we have our fights, Republicans and Democrats. But if you come from down the street and you pick on one of us, like we're on the same side. And I'm, I'm hopeful um, that when we emerge uh, in 2021 that we can restore some of that. Yeah. Uh, Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill was evidently one of those targeted, and I'm wondering, do you do you think that 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 her campaign, her that race, is of could be of particular interest, or just because it's close? Uh, I think now I might be getting this wrong, but I think when I read this, that actually Claire's office yeah. was targeted, and and oftentimes it's been reported as her campaign. Maybe a distinction without a difference, but I do think it's it's important in terms of security. Um, Look, it's probably going to be the closest, very likely could be the closest race in the country. Um, and uh, she's an outstanding person, an outstanding senator, somebody I'm very close to. There's a story about her in the book. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope everybody here will, will support her. Um, do I think it's an indication of anything? I don't know the answer to that because uh, I'm not privy to the information of how much targeting there has been. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You and Roy Blunt were neck and neck in 2016. I, can I can yeah. I add though that I do like the fact that like my U.S. senator is on the American side of this, <laughs> and not the Russian side of it. I, I do like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you and Roy Blunt, the other Missouri senator, Thanks. were neck and neck in 2016. There's there's no one thing that got us to where we are, but. When it comes to Missouri, mm -hmm. do you feel like what are what are the issues that you feel at least going forward are the most um, important to the greatest number of movable voters? You know, it's hard for me to pick an issue. I will give you some a recent, a very recent example in Missouri, which is um, one, once they had a Republican governor after 2016, and then and had a they'd had a supermajority for a while. They went ahead and, and passed. Uh, so-called right to work. It's like one of the first things they did uh, in Missouri. So just a union busting, union weakening law. Uh, and I think when they did that, they definitely felt like now we're home free. They f the Republicans in my state felt like, well, we have now really silenced the voices of working people and now we can really, we can really have at it. And, and I'm really proud of the way working people, the way labor in my state just said, no, we're not, we're not going down and went out and, and made sure that it was going to be on the ballot and organized and just crushed it, uh, you know, in, in uh, like a week ago. Um, and so we just repealed 
uh, the right to work law in Missouri. And, um, and, and I, I was out there, I did several door-to-door -door shifts for it, and I was so encouraged at people who, I, Republicans I met at the door who were like, they were like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, making people's wages lower, I don't like that. Um, so I think that's probably a pretty good indication. Um, but really, I think that it is less about, <laughs> I tell candidates all the time when they tell me, which issues should I talk about? I tell them, what do you, I ask them, what do you care about? Mm -hmm. Because voters can tell. You gotta lead with what you care about. If there is an issue that caused you to be involved and then to run for office in the first place, if you're talking about something else exclusively, no, don't get me wrong, like listen to the voters and speak to their concerns, absolutely. But lead with what you're passionate about because passion is persuasive. You know, I'm very passionate about democracy reform, campaign reform. Um, I'm, I'm very passionate about criminal justice reform. Um, and I talk about those issues. You poll them, are they necessarily the top things uh, for folks, their top concerns? Not always. But I do think that people see my passion and then it makes a difference. You know, you mentioned the, the repeal of right to work. There's also been reform-minded prosecutor elected in St. Louis County and pickups yeah. in the state legislature. I mean, Missouri seems like one of those states that's always, you know, is it magenta? Is it yeah. ultraviolet? I don't know. Um, but I don't either. What, what's... What do you think is the sort of leading indicator of these election results that we've seen, or, or are they all kind of one-offs in there? No, I think the leading indicator is this. It's that a blue wave is not a weather event. Uh, so raise your hand if you have had a conversation, and I'm going to do a roundabout politician thing, but I will land on answering okay. your question. Got it. I want to be clear. Um, Raise your hand if you have had conversations that are basically you and your friends sitting around going, how long is this guy going to be in office? Like, speculate. Okay, figure the whole room, right? Yeah. That's cool. I've done that. Um, if that is sort of the extent of your political engagement, you're going to be really down. Because every morning when you wake up and you <laughs> check your phone and he's still the president, <laughs> it's November 9th of 2016 all over again. So this is why I tell people a blue wave is not a weather event. You can't turn on the TV, like in Kansas City, I can't turn it on and see Gary Lezak and Brian Busby talking about democratic activism is going to mix with progressive enthusiasm and it's going to rain Democrats. That's <laughs> not how it works. A, a blue wave is built by people. So you mentioned um, some of the special election results we've had. Lauren Arthur was elected in a state senate district just north of Kansas City recently um, and actually has a piece of Kansas City in it. Well, that district was, was held, it was won in 2016, November 2016, by a Republican state senator by 20 points. And uh, about a month and a half ago, Lauren Arthur, a Democratic state representative, ran, because he got appointed to something, ran an open seat race, special election for that. She won by 20 points. Yeah, sure. That's cool. Go ahead. Now let me tell you your assignment, which is this. It wasn't that people in that state Senate district were, I mean, don't get me wrong, they're not happy with the direction of the country. It's not that they were just so unhappy that they just came out in droves. What it really is, is it's, you know, three days before that election, I remember I was there and I, I, I helped kick off a canvas for Lauren. There were 150 people there on a Saturday to knock on doors. That's how it happened, is that folks showed up on their doorstep, called them on the phone and said, here's why in this you know, day when you're not expecting to have an election, why I'm spending my time on this. So the indicator for me that I look at is activism and more so than, than voter, uh, you know, more so than polls, um, because there's a movement out there. And, and as long as we sustain that movement and we execute on it, we're going to have a very good November. Um I'm wondering what percentage of eligible Kansas City residents vote and what can the mayor do to increase that number? Uh, so it varies by election. Um, it was a pretty good, you know, we had, um, I don't remember the percentage, but uh, in 2011 when our current mayor was elected in a, in a competitive race, I think in the primary, uh, like it's a nonpartisan municipal, so in the first round, if I'm, I hate doing this in public, but I think I'll get it. It's something like 40 or 45,000, then it was like 70,000 people in the next round. Um, our population is just under half a million, um, but that's not a registered voter population. So, you know, I don't remember the percentage, but it's not, it's not like November of, a, of, a, of an even year uh, percentage. Um, what can be done? I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. Um, one is 
uh, I want to make sure that we're doing absolutely everything uh, to make voting as convenient as possible. I want any, any interaction you have with City Hall or any part of city government, I want it to, you know, if, I would like it if it's, are you registered to vote? It, you know, that's basic customer service. You know, making sure, uh, like I saw recently <clears throat> where somebody tweeted out um, where Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, who used to be Secretary of State, a, an old picture of when he was Secretary of State, McDonald's menus had voter registration cards on them. Like, you know, that's the kind of level of customer service I think you ought to um, aim for. Uh, and then the second piece of it is just generally when it comes to the question of voter turnout, politicians, people in my line of work, have a tendency to say, they look at a turnout and they go, why didn't these people show up? And I tend to turn it around and say like, well, people in our line of work are, are supposed to make people feel in an election between two, two candidates like they really need to be there. And so in a way, when folks don't choose a candidate, it's kind of a vote. Mm -hmm. It's kind of them saying, um, you know, that they're not gonna spend their time on that, uh, you know, choosing a candidate there. Um, and so it's on us to make sure that we explain the stakes of it, you know? Um, as you, you know, as a as a vet yourself, and as you kind of chronicle very well in your book, Outside the Wire. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you you have a lot of interactions ongoing with with veterans and folks in military circles. I'm wondering how Trump is going down with them. I mean, it tends to be a more conservative group. Mm -hmm. um, and w you know, what what feeling are you getting from talking to troops and vets? Uh, it'd be hard for me to characterize in general. I can tell you about like you said, like the conversations I've had. Um, you know, with a lot of my friends, um, many of which are still in, the ones who are still in, what they have said to me is they're concerned uh, about, you know, let me back up for a second. Um, Pre-9-11, when you would make a movie about the military or a show about the military, oftentimes it was more like Stripes if you've seen that. It was more like, there was, uh, it was sort of a send up on the military. It was, it was, and I'm not saying which is right or which is wrong, right? But then, you know, post 9-11 and since, there's been um, a different level of regard, um, a high regard for the military. And, and I've had conversations with my friends where they are concerned um, that the way that the Trump administration approaches the military and the way that it does its business and how haphazard it is, how he has, you know, I, for instance, I feel like the Obama foreign policy was, you know, uh, wind down wars, kill terrorists, and solve global problems, and the Trump foreign policy is we'll see what happens. And, and when we talk about that, they say they're worried about it, you know, accelerating it going back to the other way. They're, and I'm worried as a veteran about people taking these decisions that are made by the Trump administration and seeing them have to be executed in some cases by the military and then putting that on the military. Mm -hmm. So I've definitely had conversations. And I don't mean to sound like I'm trying to be overly diplomatic. It's just that's how, that's how my friends have talked about it. They're just worried that people are going to think it's the military making some of these boneheaded moves and not civilian leadership. Right. Um, you know, you, you had some trouble readjusting when you got back from Afghanistan, and I'm imagining that... Um, you know, like so many veterans these days really rely on the VA, and it's, you know, always kind of been a hot mess. But um, that story of the other day that came out from uh, ProPublica about how um, Trump's buddies at Mar-a-Lago were effectively instituting VA policy, um, is that, like, does that make its way outside of journalism and Twitter circles? Does that make it to active duty or vets groups? Yeah, um, stuff having to do with the VA generally generally does, particularly uh, older veterans um, who, have, who have taken advantage of the VA for longer, taken advantage of the long term, taken advantage of what they earned um, for a longer period of time. Um, I did, you know, just during my time in politics, I've done a lot of roundtables with, with uh, veterans of all ages. And one of the things that I think, one of the reasons it does is because there's sort of an unspoken tradition that when folks um, come out of the service, uh, if they just socially run into a, a veteran, there's almost like this, 
like hip pocket training briefing that ha it's almost like, okay, well, have you, have you enrolled? Have you, you know? And so these are pretty common conversations. I haven't heard about that particular story yet from folks, but it's pretty fresh. But yeah, I would imagine it absolutely has. Because the disconnect there that um, I think veterans tend to understand is, you know, like with so many other things, uh, Trump and his folks think, and, and this is largely a Republican problem anyway, that, well, if it's being done by the public sector, then therefore it is just, they just, they just act like it doesn't matter. They're like, you know, anybody who's, they, they really, I feel like, often act like if, if it's being done by the public sector, it's being done by people who couldn't get a job in the private sector. And it just irritates me to no end because, like, these are really important jobs that have really important I don't I don't need to, to belabor the point. Um, but, like, that story in particular is an example to me of probably a bunch of people who don't understand that the VA is not just about administering health care like any other health care system. If, when you read that chapter in the book, I think one of the things that you'll conclude, I didn't even mean to do it that time, <laughs> um, but one of the things that you'll be able to see from that is, just from my interactions with, with, there's a story about my interaction with another veteran in there, there is a unique element to treating veterans. And that's what I think is often missed in the stories about the VA. People act like it's just a matter of getting people in. It is a matter of this. Get people in, get them in efficiently, get them treated. But what's often missed that veterans get and that we talk about is treating veterans is not the same. And having people who treat veterans every day be the ones who treat veterans makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know. I'd like to um, segue a bit to one of the greatest Twitter moments that I've ever witnessed. Um, uh, when white supremacist Richard Spencer tweeted a link to Liza Minnelli singing the cabaret song Tomorrow Belongs to Us in reference to whatever racist thing he was up to. And in response, you tweeted, Hey, buddy, that song you love was written by my uncle. He's been married to my other uncle for 40 years, and he's a Jew. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, just, I would just like to hear a little bit about your uncle. Sure. Uh, my, yeah, my uncle is, a, is an amazing person. He is, um, his name is John Kander. Um, he, he's my great uncle, actually. Um, he, I was with him three nights ago, uh, and he, we hung out, and he had just come from uh, working um, with longtime collabor collaborators of his on a, on a show. Uh, he's 91 years old. You would never be able to tell. Um, he is uh, just, he's an amazing talent. And just more than that, I mean, he, for anybody who doesn't know, he wrote New York, New York, and Chicago, and Cabaret, and he... Um, but not everything's up to date in Kansas City, no. alas. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that. I, I, <laughs> I um, because I tend to know Candor and Ebtunes, <laughs> and that's it. But, um, and Hamilton, that's what I know, like everybody else. <laughs> um, but he's just an amazing guy. And, and growing up, uh, all I knew was that my great uncle, who I loved and I was very close to, would, over the holidays, play piano for all of us, and we'd all sit around and he would play songs he wrote. And I didn't realize that, like, those friends. were songs that everybody <laughs> loves, you know? And, um, and uh, he got a pretty big kick out of that. that. That song, for anybody, if you've seen Cabaret, you may remember there's a haunting scene. It's an, it's an amazing song, um, and it feels, like a, it's, it feels like a very warm, just... It's just a moment where you feel great and then you gradually through the song realize that it's a Nazi anthem and that it's Nazi youth who are singing it and they start exposing their swastikas. And, that, and, then, and it's like many Kander and Ebb uh, tunes or shows, you start to feel very uncomfortable about how good you feel about it. Anyway, apparently what I learned after that is that the alt-right, which is like a churched up term for Nazi, um, has, uh, or KKK or whatever, um, they, they have, because apparently they have no sense of irony whatsoever, um, <laughs> which really is no surprise. Um, <laughs> they've adopted it as an actual anthem. Like it's like, right. it's a total self. Yeah, I mean. It's like a total self-own. And um, <laughs> and so when I saw that, yeah, I was sitting around with my wife and a friend of hers, and I was just like, I typed that. I was like, I'm going to tweet this. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. And then you know, then that happened. So, so we're going to go to audience questions in a few minutes. Um, I would just like to, to get a few more uh, personal questions uh, before that goes. So you have a son named Truth, Truth Candor. True, T-R-U-E. 
True candor. Yeah. True candor. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, if you have more kids or pets, can we hope for more names in this theme? Like veracity candor has a pretty good <laughs> ring I, to it. I'm open to ideas. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, as long as you're open to ideas, um, you seem to really like Taco Bell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you ever had a good burrito or taco? Because... The, the, uh, <clears throat> this is the town for that. And I, and I feel like when people meet uh, Jason out in the lobby and get signed a book, maybe you can also tell him your taqueria of choice. Uh, uh, do you want me or, to or we can take that <laughs> fight right to Twitter. I, I, if you like Info Forum SF, be informed which taqueria you like. Uh, we have so many amazing, uh, authentic uh, Mexican restaurants in Kansas City. Yes, of course, I've had amazing tacos. <laughs> I don't really put Taco Bell in that category. You know? it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just there's Fuel. great tacos and then there's Taco Bell over here. It's like a totally <laughs> separate thing. It's, a, it's just a bad habit I have, you know. Okay, so um, where are we having folks line up there at the back? Um, uh, first question. Hi. 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 My name is Jen. Uh, I'm a social worker in the public sector. Um, Thank you. But also a, a text banking leader. In a variety of organizations. Cool. Talked to one of your guys yesterday, actually, about right. text banking. Um, and my question is this. Um, we, in the Georgia special, for example, we were texting with voters um, who were in, who we had pushed to the polls through text banking. We had, they were standing in hours long lines. We were sending them pizzas to the voting line so they would stay. Um, and we had voters who are telling us they are, the police are walking up and down these voting lines with warrants for arrest and checking everyone's ID mm -hmm. to see if they're the people in line. And there's a bit of, I'm not a hopeless sort, but there's a bit of hopelessness that comes for, for some of our folks that are doing this work around, they're using such dirty tactics mm -hmm. and such terrible efforts to keep people from voting. And I'm wondering, and then there's this whole other group that are really activists and trying to do this work mm -hmm. and who are really trying to make sure that every eligible person is registered and goes and, and can vote and goes to the polls and offers rides. And it feels like you're fighting against the people who won't follow the rules. And so I guess what I'm wondering is how do we uphold our own integrity and the integrity of our movement while fighting against the people who won't follow the rules, sure. um, which drives me crazy. Yeah. So... <laughs> Um, the answer is, you gotta, you gotta remember why they're why they're doing it the way they're doing it. Okay, that's a form of voter suppression. There's a whole bunch of other different forms of voter suppression. They do it because they know their argument's not good enough. They, you know, imagine it's like a court case, right? Like they're saying when they're picking the jury, they're like, you can put Earl and Bob and you know and some other friend of theirs in the jury, but that's it. You know, and nobody else gets to sit in the jury box. And we're going, you know what? Go find 12 people in the hallway, put them in there. We're going to make our argument. So what that should remind you of is we have the better argument. And both sides know we have the better argument. And so what we have to do is we just have to fly right in the face of that and just be that much better than them. Um, and that's what we're doing at Let America Vote. We have a, an operation in Georgia. Um, you know, that election you're talking about, the uh, sixth district special, John Ossoff's race um, that you all are familiar with. That was right after Let America Vote was born. And one of the things we did there is we looked at where the early voting locations were in that congressional district. And what we found was that they had been heavily consolidated from six months earlier in November. And in one case, there wasn't even one really open at all in the most heavily Democratic part of the district. So we put on a pressure campaign. We got one of them opened. It turned out to be the highest turnout early voting location in the primary or the first round or whatever you call it. Uh, and then I've talked to a lot of people down there who said that if Let America Vote had just been around earlier, like if we had been literally born as an organization a little earlier, with all the uh, early voting locations that got open for the second round, if they had been open in the first round, Ossoff would have won outright. He would have got over 50%. The reason I tell you that story is that's the most expensive house race in history because they spent like $18, $20 million on TV ads. It cost us $2,500 or something like that to figure all that out and to, and to do that pressure campaign. We have to stay focused on making sure that we are putting pressure on people who are actually allowing or not allowing the voting. And if we do that, we can win.
Hey there. Um, wanted to get your thoughts on um, and ask how you've been able to break through in a really fractured media environment. Um, you host a podcast, answer your own tweets, I think, on planes, um, CNN <laughs> contributor. So how have you found a breakthrough in that? And what is your advice to Democratic candidates, maybe first time candidates for breaking through? Just sort of breaking through all the noise? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, so uh, one of my very first appearances, like on cable news, I'd maybe done it five or six times at this point. Um, and I was, it was at the very beginning of the Trump care debate. They had just filed the bill. And I was on a CNN show and it was like, you know, the talking head debate thing. And they went to the other, the other fella and he said some stuff. And they came to me and, and they're like, what do you think? And I said, well, it's a healthcare bill that takes healthcare away from people. Seems like a really bad idea. And, uh, <laughs> and then I stopped talking. And they didn't know what to do. <laughs> they, they were like, they, like, the host was clearly not ready. You know, she was figured, I just kicked it to this dude. He's probably going to spend two minutes. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of when I realized that, um, you know, where I'm from, and, and I think, I don't know if it's specific to where I'm from, we speak pretty plainly. And, and I, get, I think in my case, maybe that's, that's how. That and the same way that I broke through in my campaigns. I mean, I got 220,000 votes in, in 16 from folks who voted for Trump, um, even though the only thing we agreed on is we're both afraid of sharks. And um, <laughs> he's right about that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of the end of the list. But, and I just think it's because I just told people what I believe, and I don't... I don't think a lot about how I'm supposed to say it as a politician. Um, I think that's why. I appreciate that you think I'm breaking through. Maybe I'm not. Maybe the whole premise of the question is wrong. I don't know. So. <laughs> thank you. Can I, real quick, so I don't forget, can I, can I thank uh, Inforum and, and every, like, can we just give them a round of applause and Clara too? Um, so. Basically, I'm, ha I'm having a very nice time. Thank you for I, having me. And, she, well, and, and anyway, okay, go ahead. Um, when in 2004, uh, Thomas Frank's book came out, uh, What's the Matter with in Kansas? Kansas. Yeah. It was published in Britain and in Australia, actually, What's the Matter in America? Huh. Is that really a representation? Is, is still Kansas a representation of America as a, as a balance? I read the book. I don't remember it well enough to answer your question um, real specifically. Uh, I guess, are you saying, help me you out. Know, what do you from mean? From left went to conservative and then again. Is it a balanced representation of America now, Kansas as a state? Oh, like what we're seeing out of the, out of right. the, oh, in Kansas? I, I don't know. I live in Missouri, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but what I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. I, I, the reason I'm asking this flippant. question because because you're so familiar with today's sure. situation in America, is that? Yeah, okay, I think I understand what you're asking. Right. Um, the reason I named my podcast Majority 54 is to remind all of us that 54% of the country voted for somebody not named Donald Trump. Not to be petty, but to, rem uh, seriously, but, but instead to remind us that, you know, while he may have won the election, he didn't win the argument about who America is or where we're going. And what you're seeing out there right now is a, a movement that is not a movement that starts in Washington or in Jefferson City or in Topeka. It's not in state capitals. It's not in U.S. capitals. It's a movement that starts everywhere else and goes to those places. And if you look at American history, um, those are the most effective movements in the history of our country. Uh, and so that's a big part of why I'm very optimistic. As long as we don't give up hope, as long as we continue to work, um, then no, Donald Trump doesn't. And, and like, I don't believe he represents the majority of Americans because I have factual evidence he doesn't. You know, but also um, because of what President Obama said in one of my favorite speeches of his that a lot of people aren't, don't remember, which was um, January twentieth, twenty seventeen, um, after uh, the inauguration, he was giving a speech to a small number of people, his staff, um, before he was uh, going on vacation, a well-deserved one. He he said. Uh, elections are commas, not periods. We're living through the comma. There is no finish line. I mean, there's no finish line for progress. It's just get up every day and try and make tomorrow better than today. And I think that's what we're doing. So is Donald Trump representative of America? No. And 
every poll and every election seems to um, agree with me on that. Uh, hi, my name's Joe. Uh, so I'm from uh, Tower Grove Park in St. Louis, and I uh, was going to American University. Oh, wow. Uh, interning for Russ Carnahan. Life right. was looking good. And then yeah. I got gerrymandered out of his seat. Yeah. So it kind of pissed me off. You know, didn't have a job anymore. I, um, didn't, I didn't vote for that map. Okay, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah, uh, appreciate that. So I guess yeah. really the question is, and, and we see, you know, gerrymandering is an issue, and not super familiar with your organization, so I don't know if that's something you touch on, but it seems like it keeps going to, like, it's a, who can, how can we win? You know, Maryland might gerrymander a map to have more blue seats. A lot of states usually gerrymander more red seats. Do you think there's a way to get past the let's get more numbers on our mm -hmm. column and just look at it from, like, what's fair? Yeah. Um, will you indulge me for a second? I want to add an answer to the last question, and then I want to go to yours, um, because I, I realize there's one other thing I want to say to you, sir, which is that um, something to remember is that the folks uh, who that a lot of the people who voted for President Trump, who were not like the base of the Republican Party, or the, you know, that I met a lot of these folks. A lot of them voted for me, honestly. Um, and what they were saying was not, um, okay. He was saying to them, basically, you don't like the way I treat people. You don't like me, but it's made me very personally successful, and now I'm going to do that for the country. And those folks were not saying, great, awesome, I'm all for that. They were saying, I'll give that a try. Now, whether you like that or not, that's, that was them, that was their math. What they say to me now, when I talk to them, is basically that they still don't like him, they still don't like the way he treats people, and he never started doing that for the country, that he still does it for himself but he never made the transition from leader of the Trump organization to leader of the country. And what it sounds like when they say that is, I don't like the tweeting. That's what they say. And if you dig deeper, that's what they mean. So, because I wanted to more fully answer your question. That's how we have those conversations with folks. It's not, you were wrong. It's, you know, I don't agree with you, but I understand how you got there. But he did not keep up his end of the bargain. He never started doing it for you. Now, to your question, um, gerrymandering. Uh, Actually, I think there's a lot to learn from what California has done. Um, you know, California's gone from having the least competitive congressional delegation in the country to the most competitive. Um, and I know that there's probably people in the room who don't like the system, people in the, in the room who do, and it's not perfect. There are things that could be done better. But here's my basic criteria. We need a full democracy reboot in the country. We're about 40, 50 years overdue for one. Um, part of it is campaign reform, um, which I don't need to delve into. I'm sure we all agree on that. Part of it is uh, making the general election really, really matter again. And the two ways to do that are reforming primaries, doing them differently, uh, and two, um, citizen-based redistricting. And I think it ought to work like a jury system. Who's served on a jury before or been an attorney in a jury trial? Okay. You know how the, when the judge instructs the jury, like, they take it serious. You know, you can see people go in and initially they're like, oh, I don't want to be here. By the end of the week or whatever it is, they're like, they, they feel rightfully like they've been involved in something important and they take their job very seriously. I think that drawing maps ought to be like that. Instead of letting legislators do it, politicians do it, we ought to recognize, and I talk about this in Outside of the Wire, that, <laughs> that we have this problem, which I call the party of green dots, okay? The party of green dots is based on the fact that in the mapping technology that they use, because it's all technology now, the place where the elected official lives is denoted on the map with a green dot. And so a lot of the really, really bad squiggly lines that have been driven in the, uh, drawn in the country are actually drawn in order to spare two politicians of the same party a very awkward conversation about a primary. That's, that's a big part of how that happens. And that's a real stupid reason to draw squiggly lines, right? Because the districts don't belong to the representatives, they belong to the people who live in the districts. In Missouri, we have term limits. You can only serve eight years in the House or eight years in the Senate. The map lasts 10 years. When they were redrawing the maps in Missouri, they would come to me when I was in the state legislature and they would tell me what they were drawing because they did it with everybody and they would refer to it as the Candor District. I was like, how can it be the Candor District? Like, I can't even serve it for the whole time. So my point is, uh, what this problem we have is people get elected talking about reform, they get into office and like a lot of other things, they're inspired by the fairness of the system that produced their victory. They're like, the people have spoken, I won, <laughs> it worked. And so as a result, they switch parties, not 
R to D or D to R, they become members of the party of green dots. And so what we ought to do, bring people in, instruct them just like you instruct a jury, and just like a jury, you don't give them information that is unnecessary prejudicial, that will bias them. For instance, you don't tell them where the representatives live and you don't allow them to know because it has nothing to do with it. And if, if some politicians have to run against each other, like, boo-hoo, big deal. <laughs> That's how I think it ought, to, it ought to work. We're gonna take the next four questions. They've all promised to be short. Okay. <laughs> Lightning round. All right. Hi, my name my name is Ben. Um, in a related thing to him, I've I like mapping. I sent in a map to the Pennsylvania redistricting in January. Um, but in a very related uh, term, for the past month or so, I've been working on mapping California's election, and I found it incredibly challenging to get data from that because even though we're two months out. The state hasn't compiled data, and I have to go down to the counties, and sometimes I have to call them up and stuff. And so I think as someone who's done, worked in Secretary of State and elections, what's the trade, especially as a millennial, what's the trade-off like between digitizing your data and making it all available to people so that they can view versus like keeping it secure and keeping it prevented from interference and that sort of thing? Uh that's a really good question. I'm not sure I have the answer to, and I bet you have a better one than me. But in general, um, transparency is, in most cases, like if you err on the side of transparency, it's probably going to end up better than not. Um, you know, obviously there's exceptions, national security and that kind of thing. But certainly data like that, um, yeah, as long as you're not giving away people's personal information, I think it ought to be available. But then again, I could be, have no idea what I'm talking about because you're talking about your state and not mine. So. I, yeah, I didn't answer that one. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Valiant effort, though, I think. Yeah. Um, so I know people have a lot in common. People care about jobs, health care, education. But the numbers don't lie, and there are huge gaps between urban and rural areas. Mm -hmm. Curious about your perspective on what the biggest cultural differences are. I know economically there are differences. But um, in your experience in Missouri and with people in the military, who I'm sure a lot of people came from rural areas, what are the biggest cultural differences? Uh, I mean, a lot of them are demographic, right? Um, I actually, look, I choose to accentuate the commonalities more. Um, and that's because I've been to every county in my state, um, and, I'm, and right now I'm, I'm, I'm campaigning uh, for mayor, and, I, and I'm, I'm all over my city knocking on doors and, and doing events. And what's interesting to me is how similar the questions actually are. They may come across differently, right? But when, when people bring stuff up to me, it, at the nut of it is four things that we all want for our families. We want our families to be happy, to be healthy, to be safe, and to be nearby. And, and we just come at it different ways. Like in a rural area, um, folks are really concerned uh, about college affordability, just like there are in an urban area. Maybe one of the differences would be in a rural area, it's much less likely that there's a college real nearby. And that they're more likely once they go to the urban area to go to school, if they have debt and the wages aren't high enough in the rural area, they're a lot more likely to end up staying in the urban area and not coming home. Well, you take that out a little further, uh, in Kansas City, if folks go to St. Louis or they go to Chicago or they go to New York or wherever for school, if they have more than our state average of $28,000 in debt, if they have fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in debt, our wages might not be high enough to get them back. So to me, it's more of a continuum. Um, and I've just, look, I've always believed that if you tell people why you believe what you believe and you tell them why it's gonna make a difference in their life, it'll matter. I'll give you an example. During my campaign at 16, I would be maybe in Kansas City, uh, often like at a Planned Parenthood event or something, talking about equal pay. And then if I'm two hours uh, away in the car later, and I'm in a rural area, and I'm in a room full of middle class men, I'm still gonna talk about equal pay. And I'm not gonna change what I believe, and I'm not gonna change my values or my policy, but I am going to say something I may not have said in the previous room. In that room, I'm going to say to the room full of men, I'm gonna say, if your wife is going to work and she's making less money than a man doing the same job, you both have less money to go on vacation this year or send your kid to college. So my point is, 
while we may experience things differently, we all care about the same things. We're all just trying to make it so that our kids don't feel like they have to leave and that we can be near our grandkids. And those of us who have young kids, we'd really like it if we don't have to pay for childcare all the time because uh, we love our parents and also we love it when our, when our kid's grandparent can come over so we can go out to dinner. Like it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not a lot different than that, depending on where you go. Thank you, my name is Peter. Uh, if elected mayor, um, what can you do and what would you like to do in um, criminal justice reform and prison reform at the municipal level? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I think that we should have a really big focus on um, returning citizens. I've, I've had a focus on that for quite a long time. I wanna continue that. Um, there's some good things being done in the city on it. Um, and we need a great deal more uh, community engagement. We need to make sure that the relationship between um, law enforcement and the community, and we have a department that's doing it pretty well in Kansas City, but we can always do it, we can always do it better. Um, and really right now for us, one of the big issues um, is, is really about driving down crime. Um, and that's an element of it. Like criminal justice reform, when you can take steps that make it so that people have more opportunities, I, th I believe it makes our community safer but so does effective law enforcement. We have to be able to do both. Um, you know, I try to remind people all the time that if you just look at the statistics of how many people we incarcerate in this country, if you're living in the suspended disbelief that you don't know someone uh, who has been to prison, like, you're crazy. Because if you leave your house during the day um, and spend five minutes outside and talk to a couple of people, there's a pretty high uh, likelihood, I don't care where you live, that you will interact with somebody um, who has been incarcerated. And we have a choice to make. Are we going to have folks come out of that situation uh, in a position where they, they have very little to turn to? You know, one of the things I did as Secretary of State is, is I banned the box um, for, for, app for applicants. Um, and, and yeah, and that's the kind of thing we need to do. We need to make sure that when people uh, return to society that we welcome them to society and we give them every opportunity to succeed. Thanks. And this is your last audience question. Okay, no pressure, man. <laughs> hey, Jason, I'm Jack, and uh, I really appreciate what you said about veterans, because uh, I will be one one day, so All right, thank cool. you very much. Tell me about uh, that, what are you gonna do? Uh, when I get out? No, like, like grow up? Or? Which, like, are, you, <laughs> are you in now, or? Yeah, I'm active duty Coast Guard. Coast Guard, okay, cool. All right, thanks for your service. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about Stacey Abrams, and she's super rad. Can you tell us who the other two smartest people are? <laughs> they're both they're both my wife <laughs> they're probably they're probably my wife and uh and my friend abe rakov that's probably who they are diana's number one <laughs> that was a great last question <laughs> uh, thank you all All right, I, I know as a politician, if I asked you to name the best barbecue joint in Kansas City, you'd probably be unwilling to make a choice. No, I'll do it. All right. It's, it's Gates Barbecue. Okay. Now we all know. Um, How, can I ask again, who's been to Kansas City? Good. How, who's been to Kansas City in the last three months? Okay. Come on back. <laughs> come on back. We have, we have new stuff. Gates Barbecue. <laughs> Please come. Spend money. <laughs> All right, okay, go ahead. Sorry. It's now, a, it's an informed tradition to ask all our speakers to end with the following question. What's your 60 second idea to change the world? Oh yeah, they asked me this last time. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> I don't know what I about. 60 second idea to change, oh boy, I should have thought about this beforehand, huh? Um, <laughs> that's too self-serving. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, look, I think, um, I kind of talked about it earlier, but I, I guess to me, it is um, a full-fledged reboot of our democracy. So not to rehash the same idea, but I'll, I'll use this time, my allotted time, to tell you about something interesting that's uh, going on. Um, two things. One, in Missouri, we have uh, something on the ballot called uh, Clean Missouri that will do uh, a lot of the things I just talked about. But uh, in Michigan right now, we had, we had Katie Fahey on the podcast recently who, who started this thing called Voters Not Politicians in Michigan. And it is uh, on the ballot um, in November, and I think it has a really good chance to win. And what it would do is it would take the, uh, 
Uh, it would take a state that has the is the worst gerrymandering in the country, tied with South Dakota. It's got like a corrupt double down where the state legislators don't just draft the map for the Congress, but they also draft their own map, which is like really bad. Um, and it would just take it completely out of their hands. So I, I think things like that, we need to do them at the state level over and over again so that we can peacefully overthrow our government. <laughs> All right, we're already giving the big round of applause, but I would just like to officially thank Jason Kander for joining and, us here tonight. And Claire Jeffrey. At Inform, at the Commonwealth Club. Jason will be signing books out in the lobby, so pick up a copy of his new book, Outside the Wire. I'm Claire Jeffrey, editor in chief of Mother Jones. Have a great evening, everyone. All right.